All right, everybody. It is 12 o'clock on Wednesday. That means it's time for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Welcome to the program, everybody. I am your host today and always. My name is Chris. I work at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. We're broadcasting this program to you live as we do every week, Wednesday at noon for the Lunchtime Discovery Series, which is organized and brought to you also by the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. We work together and put together a great show for you every week where we meet interesting people who are doing interesting work all across the state of North Carolina and sometimes even beyond to get the scoop on what is happening in the world of science and nature all across the state. As we go throughout today's program, remember that you can interact with me and today's guest speakers by jumping into the chat or into the comments. Let us know your thoughts about the topic as we go through the presentations. Drop questions into the chat. As soon as they pop into your brain, toss them into the chat box. At the end of the presentations, I'll be looking to the chat for your questions in order to ask our guest speakers. So participation is key at the Lunchtime Discovery Series. So everybody jump in. If anything, just jump into the chat and say hi, maybe where you're watching today's program from. We'd love to meet you and welcome you into the program. For today's show, we're going to be talking about the coast of North Carolina. So, you know, raise your hand if you've ever been out to coastal Carolina. You're like, uh, yeah, right, everybody in North Carolina, we love to go and visit. <laughs> oh, and two guest speakers, they're, they're like, yay, we, they're like sitting next to the beach for this presentation. They're like, yay, this is great. Uh, but you know what, uh, Memorial Day is coming up quite soon, next Monday, the unofficial official start of summer. And I think right now is when people start to really think hard about what days they're going to plan for those day trips to the Outer Banks or those getaway weekends. But you know what, you should do a little bit more and know a little bit more than just sit on the beach, perhaps. And so today, I'm excited that we have two guests from the NC Coastal Federation to give us the inside scoop, not on like who's got the best ice cream in the Outer Banks, but on what's happening with the environment on our coast. This is important stuff that you want to know about. Today's guests are Sarah Hallis and Rachel Bassesi. They are coastal education coordinators with the NC Coastal Federation. Welcome to the both of you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for joining us on your lunch break. I know I've enjoyed uh, participating in these lunchtime discovery series and am honored to be um, part of the presentation of the series as well. Uh, so my name is Sarah Hallis and I am the Coastal Education Coordinator for the North Carolina Coastal Federation and reaching you from our Northeast office. And shortly you'll hear from Rachel who is from our central office and we do have a third office that is on the southeast coast in Riceville Beach. And so just quick background, if you aren't familiar, the North Carolina Coastal Federation, we are a nonprofit organization whose main mission and focus is to protect water quality. And we do that through a series of focus uh, through our work, um, looking at water quality and aspects of making it a safe place for you to explore the coast for swimming and fishing and healthy habitats for our plants and animals. And you're gonna hear about a couple of focuses of our goals. And we had some of our colleagues present about oysters through this series uh, not too long ago. So you have lots of chances to hear about several aspects of our work that cover these five major goals uh, through water quality that supports those fun activities and we want you to come visit us for. Uh, we do, since we are a nonprofit organization, have a advocacy program that is gonna focus on coastal management, knowing that we have lots of interest in the coast. We also want to keep that a healthy place to be. And Rachel's gonna share with you today about our living shoreline projects that we are focused on to prevent erosion and provide habitat. And not too long ago, last month, you heard from Leslie and our friends at Sea Grant that have launched the NC Oyster Trail. Uh, so if you missed that session, you can check back in the archives for that one to learn about 
some of our work we do to support thriving oysters in an effort to protect water quality. And today I'm going to be sharing with you uh, our work on, on reducing marine debris along the coast and also invite you to participate and help us with some of this work. Uh, knowing that in our virtual platform, this is giving us the capability to reach audiences that we normally wouldn't be able to. Um, and so it's a, a blessing in disguise knowing that in the work that we're doing and each of those goals, we are focused on doing that in each of the 20 coastal counties of North Carolina. Um, so there's the symbol of me, I'm calling you from Manio and our, our office in the Northeast is in Wanchies and Rachel is joining us from our headquarters office that's in Carteret County in Newport. And then I've mentioned previously our third field office there in Brightsville Beach. And so the work that you'll be hearing from us today is taking place in all of these um, areas reaching each of the 20 coastal counties. And knowing that normally our travel would normally prohibit us from coming to Raleigh or much farther from the coast to share information with you. Uh, but there are lots of ways that you are able to participate in our work in, in our effort to protect the coast, knowing that it, it ties us all together. Um, and really, this is the, the first message that ties us all together is that even if you're not on the coast, we all live in a watershed. And no matter where you live, that water drains across the land and gets to that lowest point where it's eventually carried to a river or stream, carried out through our sounds and into our oceans, where we know from middle school science, that's where most of the water on our planet is stored in our oceans. And so the water from your backyard eventually is getting to us. And so we're recruiting all of you to help us in our, our mission today. Uh, we are a staff of about 30 or 35 people, and we have a lots of miles of shoreline and coastline to cover and to protect. Uh, so making some observations in your own watersheds and in your own backyard can help us to continue uh, protecting the coast and, and expand our reach beyond uh, where we're able to travel and see within our own communities. Uh, so looking at this image, Stormwater runoff is our main focus of thinking about our work to protect water quality. Uh, this is the number one cause of water pollution off of our coast. And thinking about water pollution as coming actually from structures and substances that start as land-based sources. And a simple investigation could be looking at your own house or business and where that water drains off of your property. Does it have a chance to absorb? through a vegetated area, or is it sent directly down an impervious surface like a driveway or a road where everything that rain comes in contact with is going to carry it out to that public or water source in your watershed. And so thinking about ways that we can act like defense to slow down this water, to soak it up and reduce any of these harmful items that might the rainwater might encounter and carry it out to sea where we won't really have a chance to clean it up. So thinking about prevention, uh, one of those items that stormwater runoff could be carrying is trash and debris. And so recognizing this, it's one of the newer goals that the Coastal Federation focused on in the last few years in establishing an effort to have a coast that is free of marine debris. And I'm sure this is a, a similar site that you may see alongside roadways up, across the, the world. Seeing trash and debris um, has increased, especially we've seen it, a change with the pandemic um, and the, our lifestyles have changed a little bit and we see this as a consequence in our environment. And we recognize this at the Coastal Federation uh, in the volunteer events that we held to help to clean up our areas. Um, thinking about the work that we do, we would approach each of our projects through education, restoration, and advocacy efforts. And we are trying to tie all of those things together through our marine debris prevention, but recognizing that we can't continue to just keep cleaning up after each other constantly. Uh, that would be an endless cycle. 
Um, and that picture was one of our first cleanups at a highway that we adopted near our office. And remembering this is a program that's offered across the state. Uh, if you have a, a stretch of highway that you are interested in helping to clean up, the, our North Carolina Department of Transportation runs the volunteer program to um, you would dedicate yourself to a specific stretch of highway and commit to cleaning that up just four times a year. And we've come a long way uh, after several years of dedicating our efforts to a specific area. The cleanup efforts have become easier. We feel like we've caught up. Um, but knowing that the cycle extends beyond that, we took a look around at some of the other key partners within the coast of North Carolina that are involved with reducing marine debris in some way, shape, or form. And we formed a network that I'd like to invite you all to be a part of. Um, we decided to reflect on what our end goal would be first. And I always enjoy coming back to this, um, knowing the challenges and struggles along the way um, it's great to imagine the finished product of um, if people in wildlife of coastal North Carolina never encountered marine debris. And what would that be like? And I can't wait to see what that will be like because I, I hope that we get there together. And I need your help. And so we recruited um, a series of partners and we released a strategic plan of sorts that we called the North Carolina Marine Debris Action Plan. Uh, so we put a series of goals together to tackle marine debris with our focus on the coast, knowing that that was the scope and range of most of the organizations involved in these efforts um, of the time and abilities that we had. And that's where I think that you all could come into play that we can recruit partners beyond our, our current region and extend this work into a bigger focus area. And so my next few slides, I'm featuring work that the North Carolina Coastal Federation is involved with that falls into each of the major goals of this marine debris action plan. And maybe there's a project that you or your organization is involved with as well. And I would invite you to participate in some of the, the planning that goes behind it. So each of these goals will have a subcommittee that meets a few times a year to keep track of the work that they're involved in and to contribute that to the, the larger efforts behind this Marine Debris Action Plan. And so we set each of these goals um, with a five-year timeframe and we'll, we're checking in each year to see our, project, our progress and then reassess um, the approach from there. All of these materials are on our website, which is nccoast.org. And I've tried to include some of the short links as well. So this will take you to the strategic plan that is our simple summary for the public that outlines each of this work. And knowing that you're hearing from the Coastal Federation, and of course, we're gonna feature the projects that we're involved in, um, but know that we're not in this alone. Uh, so once we realized the challenges that extended beyond the Coastal Federation scope of work, uh, these are the main stakeholders that we recruited to establish both a leadership team and an advisory and implementation committee to ensure that we didn't build a plan that was simply a document that was never looked at. Um, but it was work that was taking place and projects that were underway uh, with the help of all of these organizations to oversee it. And you just heard a lot of the work of the first goal of the action plan and leading and coordinating. Uh, so a lot of it just takes some motivated individuals to ensure that uh, work is taking place and that information is communicated back to us. And then I'm gonna highlight um, a major project the Coastal Fed is involved in each of these categories, realizing that the other organizations are also doing similar work and that there's a lot more happening under each of these goals than you'll hear from me today. So if any of these major categories sparks interest, please reach out and I can help you connect to the group that is involved or the staff member that is leading each of those teams uh, to learn more about ways that you can participate. So knowing that we couldn't continue cleaning up forever, prevention is a major focus and great in the environmental education world. 
Uh, of course, we're going to continue removing that debris in different ways. Abandoned and derelict vessels is a major issue on the coast that we're pleased to finally be making progress on. And we're doing all this work. We also want to keep track of it. So we also want to research and assess and, and reflect on what difference we're making or uh, what areas are we missing. Uh, so research was also one of our major goals. In preventing marine debris, the environmental and education world would be pleased to know about some of the educational resources including the Coastal Federation, we've built over the last year, a distance learning lab that takes a lot of information related to all of our work. And we share those materials online knowing that we are not visiting classrooms like we traditionally have, or we weren't able to work with groups in person. And so we shared those information, those materials through our website. So you could go to our main website and search for distance learning lab. And we do have materials specific to marine debris and all of our goals. The uh, Duke Marine Lab also developed a focused curriculum on marine debris. And that is a great resource, all, all focused on marine debris work. And that one is geared toward fourth and fifth grade, uh, but could probably be adapted to various audiences. <clears throat> and thinking about educating adults as well in our decision makers, in our businesses, we are working to expand our ocean friendly establishments and i see that this could be a program that would connect us across the state right now most of our ocean friendly establishments are in coastal counties uh, but recognizing that our marine debris is also a water pollution source that comes from land we need to start looking upstream in ways that we can all play a role in reducing the amount of debris that's there uh, so it's a program that will reward businesses for reducing their single use plastics. Um, so either not having them or creating them as an option only or choosing other sources. And there's a list of criteria that businesses could commit to um, making those decisions at their business, and then they would be recognized through this program. And I hope that you're all familiar with our, our state program that did a great education and marketing messaging uh, through Recycle More NC and realizing that a lot of the confusion came with that each town and county, the way that we process our recyclable materials um, can be different based on where that material is taken uh, to get recycled and sorted. And so they did some great social media messaging and marketing and all of those materials are online to simplify the process and eliminate confusion um, in an effort to make the materials that are recycled more valuable. Uh, so we ran into lots of challenges in North Carolina uh, with items that don't belong in the recycling bin going there anyways and it ruins an entire batch of recyclable materials. And I know on the coast, we have a bigger issue with that because we have vacationers that come here and the items that might be accepted at their home recycling center may not be accepted here. And so through the state program, they've tried to standardize the system, researching all these solid waste um, processing plants and, and standardizing which items are collected everywhere. Uh, to make it more simple. So these items are great to use on your own social media. Uh, they have the images available, they have flyers. <clears throat> I know I printed one of these flyers and, and taped it to the top of the recycling bin in the homeowners community that I live in. And it's a simple way that you can all help us to spread the word to do the right thing. And thinking back to that removal of the marine debris, uh, this is likely the one category that we have in common with the most people. When we first started our Marine Debris Action Plan, uh, we did an assessment to see which categories people were involved with. And this was the one that most everyone does a litter cleanup of some sort. And that's great. Um, and we see that, uh, that marine debris removal extends even beyond having volunteers involved as we have hurricane and storm debris come through our areas, um, it's led us to get involved with projects where we hire contractors to help us remove this debris. Um, contractors, which are typically commercial fishermen. 
who have the vessels to get there, who have the knowledge of the waterways and the currents and are still have been working for since 2019, um, cleaning up hurricane debris from several years prior. Uh, so we're focusing on that in, in ways that we can prevent and be more prepared. And our removal efforts go from large scale debris to microplastics in our wastewater and reflecting on how that may or may not be an important water quality issue we would like to take a closer look at. Some of our contracted efforts um, started in 2014 with programs we've had through various grants of hiring commercial fishermen to find and retrieve lost crab pots from the sound each winter when our waters are closed for crabbing. Uh, we established partnerships with them for the same reasons of knowing they have the boats to get there, um, the pot boilers to pull them up, the boats to carry pots that are found, and, and the knowledge to retrieve them. And we've had great success with that program. Um, these are just this past year's results. We have all the results through our website, um, knowing that with re relying and partnering with um, the commercial fishermen, we can cover much broader area and retrieve uh, thousands of pots each year. Oh, so this shows the highlights from the results from this past January where our focus efforts were on the Northeast and Central Coast of North Carolina, uh, removing those lost crab pots. <clears throat> and from that program, we've built a similar one, hiring comm commercial fishermen to find and retrieve the hurricane and storm debris. And so it's been years of work and hundreds of tons of marine debris removed and, and counting. Uh, so that work is continuing as we speak and those numbers uh, are continuing to rise. And I think we'll see the same thing once we um, have done these efforts for a few years, we'll, we'll get caught up with hurricane debris that has been there for years and years. And I think that we'll be um, ready and have the capacity to have quicker response and quicker removal so that we don't see this happen to our coast again. And so from our large scale debris from fishing gear to storm debris, it also comes down to the smallest things that we can't even see in our water. So for our microplastics, um, and we're as an organization are taking a closer look at how that affects our water quality and if we should be pursuing advocacy and policy uh, focused around how much microplastics are allowed to enter our wastewater and thus be out into the world in a capacity we can't retrieve. And the Coastal Federation taking a closer look at that this year, we have a forum coming up um, July 15th. It's gonna be virtual. And so the registration isn't quite open yet, but will be any day now. Um, but you can save that date and time to join us if investigating the impacts of microplastics in our waterways is something that is interesting to you. We hope that you will join us then. And reflecting on most of us are involved in these litter cleanups or we would see and observe uh, marine debris on the side of our roadways. I have a quick activity for you to think about. I know some of these uh, items were surprising for me. Uh, so I chose just eight items that are commonly found in our litter cleanups, um, side of the road or to the coast. And I put a number by each of them in random order. Uh, so your mission right now on a piece of paper, if you wanna share your thoughts in the chat, we're gonna put these numbers in order of how long it takes each of these items to decompose. So if we and our dedicated volunteers were not there to remove these items or prevent these items from becoming litter in the first place, how long would it take each of these items to break down to the point we can no longer recognize as far as decompose? So we can put them in order. I'm gonna reveal the answers from the shortest length of time to the longest length of time. Um, and realizing that removing this item from 
are used for recycling this item could be a much better option. And also realizing in science, sometimes there's not a straight answer. So there's a broad range of years uh, for the estimates on how long each of these items takes to decompose. And one of these items is highly debated. And every time I leave this activity, I have different response. So I'm gonna warn you about that one. And if we were in a room together, I would hand you each of these items and tell you to put yourselves in order from how long it takes each of these items to decompose to get you up and moving them around. Um, but for sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving and reveal the answers unless uh, I can't see the chat. So Chris, I'm not sure if there's any answers in the chat uh, so far or any feedback you wanna share before I click the next one and start revealing the answers. So I think folks must be, they're Googling it right now. Okay. That is, so we'll, <laughs> they're, they're trying to cheat and look it up. Okay. That's what I That's think fine. is happening. But yeah, folks, drop, drop what you think, or at least, you know, like put in the chat what you think takes the shortest and which takes the longest. Mm -hmm. So that that's what I'm looking at because all eight items, hmm, these are, a lot of these are just different kinds of plastics. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really sure on the decomposition times. I'm going to say that the shortest one is going to be number six, the cardboard tube. Mm -hmm. And that the one that would last the longest, oh, plastic bottle. Okay, that's can a it, good start. It, and hopefully you can see all my pictures okay, right? So we do have one that is aluminum can, plastic bag, yep. a styrofoam takeout container, cigarette butt, glass bottle, Yep, the toilet paper tube I added in. I thought that was a fun one for this year. Plastic straw and plastic bottle. And so you are correct in the, sh the item that would decompose in the shortest amount of time is our paper, toilet paper tube. Normally we find paper bag or paper fast food items on the side of the road. I can't say I've ever found a toilet paper tube, uh, but I thought it was a fun one to add. And that one is um, just about a month to decompose. The second item could also be debated. Uh, cigarette butt is estimated at five to 10 years. Uh, though this may vary if it does have a plastic filter inside or paper only, but five to 10 years for thousands of cigarette butts, millions of cigarette butts. I think this is the top collected item um, in all cleanups around the world. The plastic bag came next at 10 to 20 years which is another crazy item that the stats say you only use it for a few minutes and then it's around for 10 to 20 years. And often these spray into different pieces. Uh, this was the item I warned you about our styrofoam container it is highly debated. So um, my range shows this could be 50 to 100 years. I use a, a styrofoam cup in my in-person activity and put it at 50 years, but it falls into the plastic category, which really could be never. So it breaks down into smaller pieces and um, into, into those microplastics that could essentially never go away. Plastic straw is another one that was really surprising for me uh, because it's plastic, it could be up to 200 years. So this is another item that we use very momentarily and is around for much longer than we are. So I know we're familiar with a lot of the environmental alternatives of uh, carrying your own straw or having aluminum straw. Uh, the next item is about tied at 200 years with our aluminum can. Uh, this is the item that could be recycled and come back as an aluminum can at the fastest rate of all recyclable materials. So if you ever have the option to choose between certain items, I would encourage you to choose aluminum can. A plastic bottle comes next at 450 years. Another item, as you say, you're so close on your last item. Uh, so close. This is another one that could be never because it's gonna break down into microplastics or it could be recycled and returned faster. Uh, but the glass bottle would be the longest item um, at a million years or 
never because it's going to break down into finer and finer pieces and be grains of sand. So we could uh, debate well, how we would define decompose really to get to the bottom of it. But something surprising to think about on how we can maybe reduce some of these items from our use um, and make sure that they don't become pieces of trash that we're collecting from the side of the road or that have a chance to break down for such long periods of time. I did mention at the beginning, I'm gonna move through these quickly because I think I'm running out of my time in this session, that we are moving forward with work to remove abandoned vessels along the coast. So if you visit us and see this work in progress, please know that this was years in the making. Um, this is another marine debris item uh, where vessels have sat for several years uh, from hurricanes past. Uh, because of the rules and regulations surrounding that, really this is someone else's property. And do we even have permission to remove something that doesn't belong to us? And so the Coastal Federation has been working with partners to make a legislative change um, that grants ownership to uh, the Wildlife Resources Commission through a process of notifying the last known owner that gives us the ability to remove these vessels under several different grant funding resources, knowing that this is an expensive process that could take place. But we're really excited that this work is also underway as we speak. And this last portion, portion is really where you all come into play. So thinking about those items that you may be collecting on the side of the road or contemplating their decomposition rates. The reason we even know that those are our top items collected is because we need your help tracking that data. So if you are involved in a cleanup of any kind, I would encourage you to contribute uh, to collecting data about it. There's several apps that you can use. Uh, the one that we would promote is the Marine Debris Tracker app through uh, partnerships with NOAA. And there's also data sheets that can be printed um, through the Ocean Conservancy. They also have an app, uh, but we need to know what's out there and what you're finding as this data will help to influence other policy changes and other decisions around uh, removing and preventing these items in the long run. Uh, so we need help to collect this information and it's gonna guide a lot of our marine debris work going forward, especially uh, with different research projects. Uh, so we also encourage you to follow. We have uh, a social media account set up uh, called Debris Free NC. Maybe you're doing some marine debris projects that you can tag and we would share your story. Um, a lot of people ask me, well, when's the next cleanup and when can I come volunteer? Well, the next cleanup can be whenever you want it to be because you can do one right after this. If you get to a safe place and collect items on the side of the road on your lunch, uh, lunch break walk, uh, we can all do our part uh, without waiting for an organized effort and hopefully collecting your data along the way. And you can make um, a big difference by your choices. You go to a restaurant and they offer you the styrofoam takeout container. Maybe you can ask for a piece of foil instead or bring your own to-go container. Um, and maybe they'll notice that they don't need to buy as many or they're noticing that consumers don't want these items that they're offering and what can they offer instead. And I'm gonna get ready to transition this over to Rachel to focus more on some of our restoration projects that we have on the coast. But I wanted to share this resource with you as well. It's an online newspaper that the Coastal Federation established to help us to share a lot of environmental issues that are taking place throughout the state of North Carolina. Noticing that traditional journalism uh, through newspapers and attention and media, media attention to environmental stories has really faded over the years. Uh, we took matters into our own hands and started our own online newspaper of sorts called the Coastal Review Online. Um, it's very timely because the story today is about marine debris and research that they're doing with that Duke Marine Debris curriculum and comparing classes that are using that curriculum and they have control classes that are not and showing that students have the ability to influence adults uh, through knowledge that they're passing on and um, adults through their own families and adults in their own communities that aren't related to them. 
So they're doing really neat work and I invite you to read about that story today or follow along our website to stay informed about all of these issues, uh, knowing that your knowledge is power in helping us to protect the coast. Uh, with a shortage of time, I think we'll save if there's questions until the end so that Rachel can get her full time slot in there. And I'm going to introduce Rachel Vicesi, who is our Coastal Education Coordinator uh, from our central office, who is a similar role as me, and she's going to share with you on our work um, to protect the coast through living shoreline. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate that intro, and um, I will say, you know, as far as marine debris goes, one time when we were doing a cleanup a few years ago, I found $20 on the side of the road, so sometimes it pays to clean up, <laughs> and it pays to volunteer, um, so that was exciting, but again, my name is Rachel, and I'm going to talk to you all a little bit about living shorelines and community engagement. And the photos on this slide, uh, that middle one is a picture of a living shoreline at Hammocks Beach State Park. It's got an offshore oyster reef and some planted marsh grasses, which we'll talk a lot more about. And then the two photos on the edges there are some students from Moorhead Middle School who helped us plant a living shoreline at Carteret Community College. And so for this presentation, I'm going to touch on shoreline erosion um, and some traditional methods to help prevent erosion. And then we'll dive into living shorelines, what they are, how we build them, and how we involve communities and partnerships in this process. And if you have questions, feel free to put it into the chat box as well. I'd love to try to answer the questions as best I can. All right, so the coastal hazard that living shorelines address um, is both natural and anthropogenic. Uh, shoreline erosion through storms, sea level rise, higher water levels and tides, boat wakes, so waves coming in from boats after they pass by, the installation of hard structures like bulkheads, and development. And so with the increased um, frequency, of tropical storms and hurricanes, sea level rise, and some of those human disturbances that I just mentioned. Unfortunately, um, it's very rare to um, find a shoreline in North Carolina anymore that doesn't show some signs of erosion. Um, and living shorelines are a method for protecting soundside properties along our estuaries. So when I'm showing pictures and talking about this technique, um, we're talking about our estuaries and sounds, not necessarily oceanfront properties. So traditionally, the approach has been to control this erosion with bulkheads um, or seawalls. However, the hardening of the shoreline has led to the loss of valuable salt marsh and oyster habitats. So what happens is that whenever waves from a boat wake or a storm come up onto the shore and they hit that hard structure that you see there, the bulkhead, um, the waves don't really have anywhere to go. So if you see my hand here, we got a wave coming in, they hit that hard structure and they recede back into the sound and the energy goes back with it. And it causes um, a process that we call scouring where it pushes the sand back away from it. And so over time, often what we see is a loss of that habitat in front of the structure. However, when waves approach a living shoreline, such as this next picture, um, energy isn't blocked and it goes through the rocks or an offshore oyster reef and then through the salt marsh grasses and it's able to be absorbed and dissipated um, so that that energy uh, is not hitting the structure and then scouring in front of it. And so in addition to that, when the tide comes in over a living shoreline, the sediments in the water, they fall to the bottom at high tide. And over time, what you have is a, actually a buildup of sediment and sand landward of the rock or oyster sill and that helps to further protect the land from erosion. And then those plants 
those marsh plants, they have extensive root systems that help to hold the sediment and sand together. And so these two pictures are actually from the same site. You can kind of see um, the boat in the background, that little boat dock. And um, this is at Hammock Beach State Park. So in the early 2000s, they took out part of their bulkhead and then they built a living shoreline in its place. So you can see the offshore rocks there that were put in and then they went behind it and planted with marsh grasses. And so in addition to the loss of important habitat in front of hard structures like bulkheads, um, the areas landward are often compromised whenever we have large storm events. And this can cost a lot for the property owners. And um, sometimes you have to replace that whole structure. So there can be some economic costs associated with having these structures as well as the environmental impacts. And this is a site along the Bogue Sound at Camp Albemarle. And these pictures were taken right after Hurricane Florence. And you can see that landward of their bulkhead, they had some pretty extensive damage from that storm. But if you were to walk maybe 20 feet in the other direction, there is a living shoreline that was built just adjacent to that bulkhead on the property. And so you can see that the living shoreline really held up nicely during the hurricane as compared to the bulkhead in this case. And this is a living shoreline that was built using bags of recycled oyster shells. And then um, you can see the marsh behind it as well. And so I'll have a little quiz question for you. Um, so living shoreline uses plants and other natural elements to protect sound side shores from erosion. Why do you think we call them living shorelines? Is it A, the offshore structures used are always living materials? B, they work with nature and provide habitat for living plants and animals? Or C, my favorite, because I said so. <laughs> you can put uh, your- Because you said down. so. Yeah. Because cause, uh, cause you get to say so. Yes. Um, well, okay, so I'm let's I'm gonna think through it. There's you definitely use living materials because you're talking about putting the marsh grasses in there. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the chat to see if any answers are gonna come in. But if you're using spent oyster shells too, those aren't. I don't think they're still alive. My vote would be answer. B. I would right. say answer B. Let's see. Oh, you got it right, Chris. So the answer is B. They provide stabilization and habitat at the same time. So that first answer A, I threw in there to trick you a little bit. Um, sometimes we just use the marsh plantings, which are living, but a lot of times we'll use the recycled oyster shells or rock or even concrete structures, which are not always living. Um, and there's a lot of different techniques for building a living shoreline and different materials that you can use, but they all encourage stabilization and habitat. Let's see who this is next. Slide will come up. Got a little bit of a delay, sorry y'all. Okay, so depending on the wave energy at the site, and how much erosion that is there. Living shorelines can range from just salt marsh plantings where you have low wave energy or um, offshore sills where you um, kind of go offshore and build either like that rock structure on the bottom or the oyster reef on the bottom left as well. And they can also be what we call marsh to revetments. And this is a technique um, where you have a highly eroded shoreline, like in that top right photo, and there's uh, like a little escarpment or a cliff there, and salt marsh plantings would not really work at that site because so much sediment has already been lost, and so you're, you're using this technique to essentially protect um, your existing marsh from erosion, and I always like to say that marsh tire revetments just they hug the shoreline. 
So there's a different, there's a few different ways that you can build a living shoreline. All right, and here's an image of our Northeast office uh, where Sarah works out of. And you can see a couple different techniques in this photo. On the right hand side, there are some bags of the recycled oyster shells hugging the shoreline. And then on the left hand side, kind of off in the distance, they have placed these oyster domes to have a little replica in my hand here. And these are just uh, concrete dome structures that are placed in front of the shoreline and they have these little holes in them for fish to swim through. So there are a lot of different ways that you can build a living shoreline. And then Sarah also sent me some great pictures from Jockey's Ridge State Park. And these are a few before and after photos that I wanted to share. So this is on the sound side at Jockey's Ridge State Park. And you can see in this after photo, this first after photo that they built a, an, an offshore oyster reef using the bags of recycled oyster shells. And they've done a lot of planting there as well. And then this last one, you can see how the plants have really taken off and are helping to protect that shoreline from erosion. To show how effective green shorelines are, these are some photos of a property in Pinal Shores on Vogue Sound before and after construction of a rock sill by a contractor. And so you can see that after nine years of having the living shoreline, the sediment has built up, the marsh has grown, and it's making that shoreline more resilient to storms. And in addition to protecting from erosion, living shorelines also provide really important habitat for oysters, fish, crabs, shrimp, all kinds of critters, um, a healthy oyster reef, can be home to up to 300 different species in the estuary. And if the living shoreline is built in an area where oysters naturally are, then they can support significant oyster populations. So this is also along the Bogue Sound in Indian Beach. All right, so I want you all to tell me why you think oysters are important. Um, I don't know if you can raise your hand or do a thumbs up if you'd like to eat oysters. Does anybody like to eat oysters? It's kind of an uh, folks, are, folks in the chat can definitely drop like a thumbs up emoji into the <laughs> chat box <laughs> if, if they like to eat oysters yeah. or enjoy. Sarah likes oysters. Nice. I've only had, I, uh, when we had some of your colleagues on talking about oysters at the last presentation, I have to say, uh, we chatted about how I've only had oysters once, and I don't think they were Carolina oysters, so I can't say that I enjoyed them as much as I probably was supposed to. <laughs> well, there's a lot of different ways you can eat oysters, too, um, but you come visit us. We have oyster roasts from time to time. We would love to see everybody out here on the coast, but they provide food for people and other animals. They also provide um, habitat that we talked about for a lot of different species. And then the third one, the three Fs of so food, fish habitat, and filtration. They help to clean and filter the water. So while the oysters are eating their lunch, they're cleaning and filtering the water at the same time. Single there. So here's another quiz question for you all. How many gallons of water do you think one adult oyster can filter in a day? Is it A, up to two gallons, B, up to 50 gallons, or C, up to 15 gallons? Oh, I'm going all the way. I think maybe I don't enjoy eating oysters in the way that I have in the past, but I do very much appreciate the ecosystem benefits that they provide. So I'm gonna go with answer B, I think 50 gallons a day. I think they're really great at it. Good job, Chris. Once again, up to 50 gallons of water a day, one oyster can fill Oh, I'm so smart. <laughs> I'm so so smart. that is about a bathtub size full of water 
that an oyster can filter. So if we have healthier oysters in our estuaries, we'll also have cleaner waters. And then I just wanted to mention that it really takes some village um, to implement living shorelines. We can't stress enough how important partnerships are. And we really couldn't do any of the work that we do without our wonderful partners, um, you know, from students, businesses, uh, state parks, local government officials. It really does mean a lot when we have people come alongside us and help us to implement these types of projects. Um, and it also helps to obtain funding for them at the same time. So this is a picture of Paul Donnelly. He used to be the superintendent of Hammock Beach State Park. And that was a really, really strong partnership that we continue to this day. And we've built a lot of living shorelines out there with the community and through Paul's help uh, at Hammock Beach State Park. So thank you all at the park. All right. And then more recently, to, due to like a higher demand in living shorelines, which is a great thing, we're relying more and more on marine contractors to help us to build these structures and implement them. And so there's actually some funding that we've gotten recently and in the past through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's um, Ecosystem Resiliency Grants Program and some community assistance programs with North Carolina Soil and Water where private shoreline owners, property owners can um, request funding to help them build a living shoreline. And so having contractors ready on board who can help with those projects has been really essential. And then uh, there's also been some trainings that we've been able to do through North Carolina Coastal Reserve and again, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to train marine contractors, um, which is helping to create jobs on the coast as well. Sorry, my slides are just a bit delayed. Okay. And many of the living shoreline projects that we've built have been through hands-on education and restoration. And so we've involved the community and students um, from camps to businesses to school groups. And um, whether they're planting, so younger kids can help plant, older kids can help, put out the oyster shell bags. Um, we really, really rely on our community to help us. And um, we've also gotten community buy-in buy by having some living shoreline open houses where we meet with uh, contractors and private property owners to encourage this type of technique on their shores. Here are some wonderful volunteers at our Northeast office helping to build the living shoreline. You can even see a dog in there helping. Look how excited they look to be out there. That could be you all. You come volunteer with us. Um, we also love working with educators and teachers. So we've been able to be a part of some wonderful uh, teacher trainings through UNC Institute of Marine, or, sorry, UNC Institute of the Environment in the summers and a few other ones and the Albemarle Pamlico National Estuary Partnership does some teacher training that we've been involved in and we have different activities that educators can use and students can use which you can find again on that website Sarah mentioned our distance learning lab that is linked there at the bottom. So those are free to use if you're interested. And then funding. So in order to implement all of these projects, you know, we've been really fortunate to receive funding from a lot of different organizations. And this is just a short slide to show you, you know, that the funding comes from a lot of different sources. And again, we wouldn't be able to do it on our own. And you don't have to live on the coast to help. Um, we need help in a lot of different ways. And this organization, I See Change, is a citizen science project. And you can go to that website and download an app onto your phone and take pictures, which will help them to record data and 
come up with solutions for different um, uh, climate issues and learning about how we can work together. Um, so what you do is you watch the weather and the climate near you, and then you record what's happening personally where you are, and then they will create a community record and can help um, gather solutions as a team. So that's one citizen science project that you can join in on. And just to wrap up, you know, as a takeaway, as humans, we've been instrumental in changing our natural landscape, but we can be smart about the ways that we protect our properties from flooding, from erosion, from marine debris, from marine debris. And um, we can work with nature to help provide habitat and solutions at the same time. And so as we've seen with living shorelines, um, these approaches are often more resilient than the traditional methods that have been used. And this is a starfish or a sea star that we found at Carteret Community College just last week when we were planting there with some volunteers. So the living shoreline at that site is already uh, providing habitat for a lot of different organisms in the estuary. And other ways that you can help Coastal Federation, we are a member supported nonprofit, so you can join us or donate if you would like to. We would love to have you come alongside us. Our website is just ncoast.org. If you go to our website, you'll see an events calendar, a page where you can learn about volunteer events that we're having. We're just starting to do more public volunteer events um, now that the COVID restrictions are kind of lifting, and all of our events are outside. We also have that snazzy license plate in the bottom corner, and um, you can follow us on social media. Our tag name is just NC Coastal Fit. So we would love to have you come along and um, meet us one day out here at the coast. If you're just visiting, we have offices spread out like Sarah showed you. So you can find us no matter where you are on the coast. And this last slide is just for questions, comments, or concerns. I think. Um, maybe if you have a question on marine debris, we'll get Sarah back on here. If you have a question about living shorelines, I'll be here as well. But our contact information is also on the bottom there. All right. Thank you both very much. Big round of applause from everybody in the audience. I can hear them clapping. I'm sure they're out there giving you a great big round of applause. Uh, let's turn to the chat and take some questions. So the first one that popped up is about living shorelines. Jamie wants to know where somebody could obtain these materials like the oysters to build a living shoreline if they have coastal property. So um, all of these living shoreline projects have to be permitted through the state through the Coastal Area Management Act. Um, and we have materials at our office. Um, we usually purchase large chunks or portions of oyster, recycled oyster shells from a fish house in Elizabeth City and have them delivered to the office where I'm at, I'm at in uh, the central part of the coast. And then I think volunteers in the northeast part of the coast also um, collect recycled oyster shells from restaurants and other events and bring them for these projects there. Um, but we, if you're a private property owner, I would encourage you maybe to reach out to one of the marine contractors that we work with. Um, you can also email us at livingshorelines at nccoast.org. And when you email that account, you'll get a response right away that has a lot of different resources and contacts for you to reach out to. And I think Sarah just put my email in the chat for the YouTube as well. And we can we could help you get started, you know, in the process um, because uh, it is a bit of a process with the permitting and such. Uh, do you know when your next Living Shoreline open house is going to be? I don't. I do not. We haven't scheduled one at the moment, but we do have one that was recorded from last year. And so if you, again, send an email to that living shorelines at ncoast.org, you'll get a link to that recording. And it's also on our website. 
um, ncoast.org. There's a tab at the top where you can learn more about our goals and Living Shorelines has its own webpage and it is linked in that page as well. But hopefully soon. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Lisa writes that you both do such great work with students. Do you have an example of an activity or project that really drove home a message with a group of students? You want to take that, Sarah? I don't know who wants to take that one. Oh. Sarah? Well, my favorite activity would be coming to the coast to go staining with us and catch and release animals that are living in a living shoreline and learning about the estuary being the nursery of the sea. Um, but if you can't visit the coast, I think that's where the distance learning lab may come into play. Um, so if you visit that category of coastal exploration, uh, there will be a few things there. Or Rachel, I don't know if you want to point out a specific living shoreline activity there. Yeah, I like the um, one that's on the distance learning lab called Sh Shifting Shorelines. And it's it was in one of the slide pictures where we have a tub of the um, sand and like fake grass and a little fake oyster reef and they make waves and kind of measure erosion and deposition. So that's a fun one. And then I'd have to agree with Sarah. I really like when we can do the hands-on activities outside, um, but there's, several games and um, other activities that are linked on that distance learning lab page that are fun to play as well. We like to play games with the students. If we can sneak the lesson into a game, then that's the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I bet mean, that strategy works for me too. Not, not just elementary school kids. Mm -hmm gamifying the science yeah. love it um sarah you know during your presentation i'm pretty curious to learn a little bit more about the process for dealing with these derelict vessels and abandoned mm -hmm. boats mm -hmm. uh, because i feel like seeing pictures or visiting the coast they're kind of everywhere not everywhere but mm -hmm. you can't visit without seeing what mm -hmm. looks like a boat sitting on a dock that hasn't been touched in decades mm -hmm. And like the process for not only taking ownership of them, like the legal side of it, but mm -hmm. just what do you do with a big boat that's been barely floating maybe for, mm -hmm. for so long? Yes, it's been a big challenge on the North Carolina coast. So we have been able to make progress on the legislative change that will, uh, the processing involves identifying the boat. Um, then we would run the boat numbers to try to find the last known owner of the boat. And then that last known owner would receive a letter um, telling them of our process of wanting to remove it or declare it as abandoned or derelict. Um, and then they would have 30 days to reply to that letter and that will determine some of the next steps. Uh, so the Wildlife Resources Commission has been a, a leading partner in this, uh, among others, and several large grants uh, through NOAA that Rachel spelled out, uh, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, to go through and make a database of all of these. Uh, so we have some catching up to do in um, identifying the GPS coordinates of the abandoned vessel. Um, and then going through the process of identifying the owner and sending the letter um, and whether or not we're receiving permission or not to proceed with removing it. Um, but there, there is great cost involved with removing it. Um, so we're glad to bring awareness to this issue and receive support to be able to move forward. Um, and so we have recently hired a contractor that is going to be doing work on the entire North Carolina coast. Um, they've started in the southeast and are working their way north. Um, so we have a goal with all of our grant funds to remove 80 vessels this year. And I think at this point, we've removed about 30 or 35 so far. Um, and so, yeah, the contractor at each site will be different. We've also established a best management process and practice uh, so that as they are removing the vessel, 
the shoreline is disturbed in the least amount that possible. Uh, so we're not dragging heavy equipment or uh, the hull of a boat through a shoreline and creating erosion on these sites that we're working hard to restore. Um, so working closely with the contractor to preserve those areas and delicate habitats where they're working um, to remove them just one at a time. Excellent, excellent stuff. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see, I'm, look, I'm checking, I'm looking at the chat and we're, uh, let's see. Kathleen's got a great one here from Facebook. So we'll take this one and then we'll call it a show. Uh, Kathleen writes, I live by the Chesapeake Bay. There's a lot of competition between the commercial fishermen and environmentalists about where to set oyster beds. Is there a benefit to setting up oyster beds in shallower water where uh, fishermen don't go, but will still benefit the bay? That's a great question. I don't know if there's any North Carolina lessons to be learned. I don't know that we've seen this um, competition really with our work. Uh, the oyster reefs that we build for um, the living shorelines, they're only allowed to be built so far off of the shore um, so that they don't impend with uh, navigation. So I don't think that we've really run into that problem. Either they're hugging the shoreline as a marsh to revetment or they're only like so many feet offshore um, allowed by the permits. So I'm, I'm not sure, Sarah, have you heard of any of that? The other example I would think of are other efforts with oyster restoration. We would deploy, we'd put loose oyster shell back to deeper areas in the Pamlico Sound to restore the oyster reefs. And then I think we do find a compromise in restoration of once a reef is established, it might be closed to fishing for three years and then open to commercial harvest after that. Uh, or some of them are established as permanently closed to be true sanctuaries so that the oysters can keep growing and reproducing and um, sharing that population with areas nearby. So each site would be built differently, um, but I think finding that compromise and that maybe it's closed initially to allow the site to establish itself uh, and then eventually be part of a commercial harvest is, is a good way of bridging those partnerships. And also knowing that when you restore a reef in those deeper waters, it's also creating that overall habitat, attracting fish to the area. Uh, so I know we would develop those partners with recreational fishing industry too, so they could go there by boat and do some hook and line fishing, uh, whether it's keep or catch and release, and knowing that it's promoting and improving habitat for lots of users overall. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Rachel, Sarah, thanks for being on the program today and sharing with us all your knowledge and expertise about the work going on uh, on our coast with the Coastal Federation. Really appreciate it, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Fun. Thank you, enjoyed it. And folks, thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Of course, we will be back here next Wednesday again at noon. You can check out North Carolina EE on Twitter to get updates about this program. You can also go to the Office of Environmental Education's website, which is eenorthcarolina.org. And there you can see upcoming events and programs. You can also check out the museum's website, naturalsciences.org, and follow us on social. We're at Natural Sciences on all major platforms. And of course, you can just subscribe to the YouTube channel right here. You're already here. It's one button click away. And then you'll know when we're going live with another great YouTube live event, just like this one. We do several programs similar to this throughout the week. So there's lots of opportunities to meet interesting people and learn something new. So I hope I'll see you again very soon. Until then, take care, stay safe, and keep your community safe. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody.